17 and all your dreams are knocking on your front door. I'm coming to you in the most vulnerable state of my life ever. 25, you realize that nothing is the same as before. I struggle with that boundary and I do struggle with saying no. Where did we go? Where did we go? Where did we go? All of those years. My kids deserve their mom sober and alive. How did we end up? How did we end up? How did we end up here? I am done. I am okay being by myself. Is it all? Hi, beautiful people. I'm Rachel Severs, and you're listening to Consent to Treat. Hello, beautiful people. You are listening to Consent to Treat. I'm Rachel Severs, life coach, counselor, and I eat cucumbers whole. Why do you need to cut them up? Just eat them. Today, we are listening to another real-life counseling session between me and Olivia, a single, stylish, 30-year-old Mexican-American female who is learning to thrive despite experiencing occasional depressive episodes. She lives in an apartment with her roommate, has mad baking skills, and had gastric bypass surgery last year. Olivia is the only daughter in a family where men's needs come first. Men make the decisions, men provide for the family financially, while women stay at home, care for the children, and serve the men. As we learned in season two, she first started therapy in 2014 to work through anxiety, depression, and interpersonal issues with her family. Now, much of her focus is around boundaries, valuing herself, and managing life with depression. Today, Olivia is on the precipice of change. Having had a major surgery to improve her physical health, is she ready to take the leap into a new career? Start dating? Remove toxic people from her life? I think she is. For the sake of her privacy, we are keeping Olivia's real name and identifying information hidden. She has given us permission to record and publish this session. Please be aware, sessions with me always include mature language. And with that, hate it, love it, learn something. Enjoy. If it's if it becomes too uncomfortable, you just let us know. Okay. You you don't owe us anything. Okay. <laughs> I've been hearing that a lot in my life lately. Really? <laughs> I have, yeah. Tell me about it. A couple of people I want to say in the last week have said exactly that or like almost kind of alluded to it in a way where it's like you don't have to do that you don't owe me anything like it's been really weird to hear because it's like I never think about that like I don't think about that as a concept like you know what I mean okay and I have this new friend he came over to hang out a few weeks ago and then texted me one day I had a day off and he was at work He's like, oh, so you have the day off, so you're making lunch. And I'm like, no, (laughs) I'm not, actually. (laughs) I'm, like, trying to clean up my house. Wait, can we just pause for a second? Yes. The fact that you said no. (laughs) Whoa. Were you comfortable saying no? And if so, why? What? What? No, I felt really bad. Like, I feel bad when I say no. Uh Uh-huh. Obviously, that is a conversation we've had the whole time that you have known me. Well, yeah, I just stopped the whole session because I want to talk about it. Yeah. Because it's so, I mean. (laughs) This bitch said what? (laughs) You said in O. I did. Okay. It wasn't like, oh, I don't want to make you lunch. It was more of like, not right now is not. Like, I have to plan for that stuff. I don't really feel comfortable having people just swoop into my house at the last minute. It makes me very uncomfortable. And it's something I've actually noticed about myself in the last couple of years even with my roommate moving in Uh like when he was staying there it was fine but then when he actually moved in I had like a whole meltdown because this this person was gonna be here every day yeah my home is like my space that I've created just because of a lot of the things I've gone through in my my life growing up and not ever really having a space of my own and having somewhere to retreat to when I need to refresh myself and and kind of rest. And I don't like, you need to ask permission before you come over there because this is my personal space. 
I'm like, I'm just even looking at your face (laughs) as you said, you need to ask permission to come into this space. Yes. Like you got this little like power thing going on. I don't like people just showing up at my house. Okay. Also because I have these periods of extreme lows Mm -hmm. and I don't do shit around my house. I don't do my dishes. I don't do my laundry. I don't clean. And you don't want someone coming in on that? mm Mm-mm. Nope. So that's another reason too is one, this is my personal space Mm -hmm. and you need to have permission to to show up in it. And two, if you just show up, it might not be when I'm in a good place either. Mm -hmm. So you definitely need to have permission for me to do that. So I wasn't necessarily in a low, but I was in a, a week where I was very, very tired. And so I didn't clean up. And so I was like, no, you can't. Um, I'm not making lunch because one, you're not coming in my space right now because of how it looks. And two, I'm, I'm cleaning. I'm busy. Like I'm not in the place to entertain someone. Yeah. Is there a time in your life when you would have pushed through and said, yeah, sure. Yes. I'll make you lunch and come over whenever you want. Yes, there was. Yes. Yeah. I've done that before. Yes. Cool. So I'm, and I, I'm just asking you cause I want to just point out the contrast there. Mm-hmm. Just a little pat on the back recognizing growth. Yeah. It's cool. When I first moved out in my old apartment, Mm. yeah, I would just be like, yeah, you can come over. Yeah, you can go. Yeah, I'll make lunch. Yeah, I'll make dinner. Yeah, I'll do that. Mm. And I would like kill myself trying to make it happen and clean and cook and get everything ready. And like, I'm no, I'm tired. I'm not going to do it. And that's that. He was taking his lunch and he was like, man, I'm about to pay you 20 bucks to go nap on your couch. And I'm like, you could nap on my couch, just not today. <laughs> like, you can do that for free. I don't care. Just not today. And then that's when it went into the, like, you don't owe me anything. You don't owe me a meal. You don't owe me a nap on your couch. You don't owe me your time. You don't owe me anything. And I was just like. What happened internally when you heard those words? <laughs> cannot compute. I did, I did not know like what to do with myself it was like shaking up a bottle of oil and vinegar like it was not Mm. wanting to mix I did not understand like okay what do you mean so when I say the words you owe him what happens internally then I almost feel like it's a more acceptable comment but for lack of a better way to say it yeah it's more acceptable to say well you do owe them Mm. But for someone to, like, tell me, you don't owe me anything, it's like, wait, I, I don't? What's the catch? Mm-hmm. What do you mean when you say that? Why are, why are you saying that? So it's almost like I owe these people something. That's almost like a, a puzzle. You can put all the pieces together. You can see where it came from. You get it. And then you can take them apart. Mm-hmm. You can deconstruct that because you've done, you've done some work. But... I don't owe these people anything. It's like the pieces don't even create a a puzzle to begin with. Mm -hmm. They just don't fit. Like for me to say it in response to someone is one thing. But for someone to be forthcoming and lay that out Mm -hmm. for me, like you don't owe me anything. The look on your face is like sheer confusion. (laughs) And that's how I felt. Like I literally (laughs) looked at my phone like, wait, what? And it almost like created this like, did I say something or do something that made you think that I think that? Or like, what's happening here? Like, doesn't everyone think that somebody owes them something? Because everyone I've encountered seems to think I owe them something. (laughs) (laughs) So it was, it was weird. It was a weird experience. So then even to hear you say, you don't owe us anything. It's like, right. Right. Wait, uh, what? And is there there's someone else that you heard that from or is it just the two of us? Well, my roommate, he didn't say specifically that, but it was this very weird moment where it was like, you don't have to do this. You don't have to be this person. You don't have to do this these things for me. I did the same thing. Like I was very confused because mm-hmm. I went to the store because I make dinner. I do the cooking. I don't trust that fucking guy in the kitchen. I don't know what he's going to come out with if I have him do the cooking. (laughs) Um, So I was like, you know, are you hungry? Like, what do you want for dinner? I'm not not really all that hungry. I'm like, 
okay, well then I won't get like anything to make like a big meal. I won't. He's like, well, I might be hungry later. And I'm like, okay, then I'll go roam around the store and just see what I find that can be like something small that like you can snack on. Like something, I don't know. I'll figure wow. something out. You are so nice. Yeah, I'm told that a lot. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why. But um, because so I'm like. that's a very kind thing. That's yeah. going above and beyond. Yeah. And it wasn't, didn't seem like a big deal to me at the time because that's, I guess that's how I show that I care about someone. I make yeah. them food, I bring them food. I bake brownies and I make cookies and I make you things. And oh, look it. It's like my love language. Ha. I love you. Here's food. Let me feed you. <laughs> Let me take care of you. And that's, for me, it's important for it to be something that he's going to eat because I'm not going to be able to eat a lot of it because mm-hmm. I take two bites and then I'm done. Because of your surgery. Because of my surgery. Right. So I'm not going to get something that only I like and I'm going to make enough for two people. And <laughs> no one's going to eat it. Right. It's a waste. So finally, I ended up, I'm just going to make wings. Boys like wings. Everyone likes wings. He'll eat that. He loves them. Went home and I walked in the kitchen and so I'm taking everything out. I'm like, I'm going to make wings and I'm kind of just doing, putting everything away, doing the thing, you know, you know. And so he walks into the kitchen and then he just like grabs me and like puts his arms around me and just hugs me. Thank you. And I'm like sitting there so confused. I didn't do anything. I'm just making you dinner. What are you thanking me? What? 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 So I'm just like, okay, for what? (laughs) Like, for what? And he's like, just thank you. And I'm like, for what? I mean, you're welcome, but like, what for? And he's like, you don't have to do these things. You didn't have to go to the store. You didn't have to do And you did. Thank you. That's what he meant. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like are you okay? (laughs) Like, is everything okay? Like, are you all right? Are you good? Are we good? You you good? Help me understand how you think you didn't do anything there. Because I, I heard you have a conversation with your roommate. You decided to get in the car, which probably meant you had to throw some clothes on. You had to put a bra on, go to the car, go to the store, park, walk around, think a bunch Come up with ideas, get creative, spend money, spend time. Maybe your back was hurting. Maybe your legs were hurting. I don't know. Get back in the car, go home, put all the groceries away, then prepare the meal, which means dirtying the dishes and serving the food. Help me as someone who really doesn't like going to the grocery store, cooking or cleaning. (laughs) Help me understand how that is doing nothing. Right. In in your mind. Okay, see, when you put it like that, <laughs> I guess I did some things. But that doesn't uh, compute to having done something. Why? N- no, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, okay. I didn't feel as though it, I was going out of my way to do something, maybe. I don't, I don't know. Mm-hmm making dinner and I mean yeah I'm doing something and yeah it's it can be a lot of work and yeah over time it builds up and I get exhausted and I get irritated and I get frustrated and yeah of course I'm human I guess it's like taking care of other people is like just something you do it's It's like like brushing your teeth it's like putting a bra on when you go to the store. It's like, you know, wearing shoes when you're outside. It's just, I, you just do. I just do. In my brain, it's not doing things for people. Taking care of others outside of myself mm-hmm. is just like the concept of you wake up in the morning and you make a pot of coffee. Yeah, what what I'm hearing it it's like when when we say you don't owe you don't owe us anything you don't have to do that, you're almost hearing something like you don't have to breathe. Yeah, you don't have to brush your teeth. You yeah, don't have you to have to be presentable to the world. Yeah, yeah, you don't have you, to. You don't ever have to get out of bed. No. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Caring yeah. for others is just such a part of your makeup. There's nothing wrong with that. 
as long as you're aware of it and you rein it in when it starts to exhaust you. But what a beautiful part of who you are. If that's nourishing to you, you love to connect with people that way. Beautiful. That's your thing. We don't want people taking advantage of it. We want you to rein it in. We want you to be able to say no. Yeah. <laughs> Which you're, you know, you're better and better at that every day. Yeah. So, yeah, that's been an interesting. You don't owe anyone anything. It's an interesting concept. Right. There, there's a couple things here. When we hear something from other people over and over again, <laughs> it's a it's a good indication that we should do a little introspection because we do position ourselves and we do train the people around us to expect certain things from us, to treat us like we are in a particular role. We do. We just, usually we're not doing it consciously. But the fact that, you know, you kind of heard it from three people in sort of a big way, sort of straightforward this week, that's your opportunity to look within and say, okay, what am I doing? Maybe even subconsciously that's making these people think that they have to tell me <laughs> that I don't owe them. <laughs> yeah. What is it about my personality that someone actually is like, I'm going to actually verbalize this to you. Although with your roommate, I didn't quite hear that, you know, no, he was no, just being he would never grateful. Actually say it out loud, which is stupid. That's progress. Yeah. <laughs> progress is progress. You're training him. No matter. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> but I, I don't mean this in like a derogatory way at all. But, you know, you are somehow sending the message to us that you might not defend your boundaries. And what would that shift look like to start sending people the message? No, if I'm uncomfortable, I'll definitely tell you. Or if my answer is no, I'll definitely say no. You can trust that. Yeah, that makes sense. Because you're right. I won't tell you. (laughs) I won't tell you (laughs) unless it's like an extreme like, okay, you're backing me in a corner and I'm really uncomfortable. So I have to tell you. And it's like that with most things in my life. If I don't want to do something, I'm not going to do it. I'm, I'm fairly stubborn in th- that aspect. Mm-hmm. So there has to be a part of me that's like kind of okay with it usually. But yeah, I, I struggle with that boundary and I do struggle with saying no. And I think, yeah, that probably is picked up from people around me that, okay, she's, she's probably not going to say no. And she's probably feeling really bad bad that she isn't going to make me lunch or, you know, like she doesn't have time for me today. Like she's not ever going to not go to the store and wander around and figure out what it is that I want to eat and what's going to make me happy. Like she's not ever going to not make me dinner or not make sure there's food in the house for me. She's not going to tell me if she's uncomfortable. She's not going to do that. And I'm not. So thinking about where this behavior comes from, I mean, you learned at some point that you can't tell people when you're uncomfortable, right? Like that's not an okay thing to do. It's dangerous somehow. I can't say no. I have to give and give and give and give and give. Unhealthy people do not like it when we say, no, I don't want to do this. No, I don't like it when you do that. They don't like that, right? Because they can't tolerate that. How are you doing? I'm okay. So I know you know this. The practice of changing that, of actually vocalizing when the answer is no, actually saying, okay, I'm not going to give any more. It will feel terrifying. And over and over and over, it'll feel terrifying until, you know, you've practiced it so long that it doesn't feel terrifying anymore or that the unhealthy people in your life have peeled off and they're no longer there because they don't like (laughs) your nose. And then you're only surrounded with healthy people who are like, yeah, no, those are cool. Do you feel like it's an issue? I mean, does it cause you distress in your life? It can. To you, is it worth your energy, like working on something like that right now? I don't know. Take your time with it. (laughs) 
so like tapping into gosh where did this come from <laughs> yeah it was a little overwhelming yeah i'm going to be honest about my current state right now okay. <laughs> the woman in me who cares very deeply about the woman in you is angry i hate the fact that especially women are are taught that our value is taking care of other people <laughs> And you don't have to do anything with my anger. <laughs> just wanted to let <laughs> you know. know. It's fine. <laughs> if you're if you're sensing something in me right now, that's that's what it is. And you know, something that you mentioned while we were taking a little break was that it, you know, within your family of origin, it still happens today. You know, you still get that strong message of if you're not providing some sort of care or service, then we don't need you around. You are not the only woman who experiences that, and it's infuriating. It is. I kind of want to shift our focus to the situations and relationships in your world that send you the opposite message, that I take you just as you are. You don't have to do anything for me. I just like being around you. I just like hanging with you. Who do you know in your world that would say those words to you? I know I would. So everyone in your world knows you as someone who's providing something to them. So they wouldn't even know. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure there's maybe one or two that wouldn't really have to do anything. There's a few I wouldn't have to do anything. Yeah? Yeah. I think so. How do you feel in their presence? Sometimes I feel awkward when I'm with someone and... I don't have to do anything. Yeah. I don't know what to do. I feel really weird. Yeah. You haven't gotten a lot of practice at just being somewhere. It takes a long time for me to get comfortable with it. Yes. With someone. I... I'm i like nodding like crazy because yeah. I'm like, yes, me too. Yeah. I totally understand how you're feeling. Like I have one of my friends. He moved away and he was that way. I didn't have to do anything. And he would be like that with me all the time. Like, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> Bitch, stop. Uh-huh. Like, <laughs> Quit it. <laughs> stop it. You don't have to fucking do anything. And even after he moved, I would go visit. And it was like, it was so nice because at first it was weird. Like my first few times going, I didn't quite know how to take it. And so they had to like, no, no, no. I would be like, no, I'll do it. No, it's okay. I No, you don't have to do that girl, stop. Don't. Just relax. Just enjoy. Let us take care of you. Like, Mm. I joke around and I'm just like, I get treated like a princess there. I don't have to do anything. I don't have to pay for anything. I don't have to cook. I don't have to clean. And they want you back. Yeah, (laughs) they do. Yeah. (laughs) Relationships like that, you know, this is how we begin to heal. We we put energy and time and focus into relationships like that where we're getting the opposite message from what we were wrongfully taught in our early childhood. And for some of us, we continue to be taught throughout our life. But the more and more you spend time with this person who's like, I don't, I don't need you to do something for me. I just like hanging with you. I just like being in your presence. The more and more that trust begins to build that trust in ourself, that I'm, I'm valuable to people without giving them something or doing something for them, sitting through that discomfort. You know, good for you that you you continue to come back to the table with this person, even though it's uncomfortable sometimes. Yeah, I really, I really don't know what to do with myself uh-huh. with those kinds of things. It's really weird. Even in my own home, I don't know what to do with myself because it's happened a few times with my, even with my roommate. Like after I had surgery, I was home. I was home for a few months, good few months. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wanted to like decorate the house for Christmas and do a nice thing for not just for me, but for my roommate and, you know, and do have something nice. And he just looked at me and just got so mad. You don't have to do like, stop. You don't have to do it. And I got so upset and I started crying because I cry. If you can't tell, I'm a crier. I love it. <laughs> and like, he felt bad because 
you know, tough love and I'm very sensitive. And he was like, I don't mean that it's not nice. I like what you're doing and I appreciate it and I enjoy it, but you don't need to do all of that. You don't need to make all of this happen. All you need to do is just be here and just relax. That's it. And I just sat there staring at him in confusion like, huh? Does not compute. What? Yeah. Why would you want to live with me if I'm not doing all this stuff? Exactly. Why would you want to be here? And I didn't understand. (laughs) I didn't understand. Like, I didn't know how to take that. And that's like a constant in my life. Like, hey, you don't have to do all that. It sounds like you're being presented with maybe your next, your next little hill to conquer. And that is actually actively practicing just being with people, however uncomfortable that is and feeling lost in that, you know, I totally empathize with not knowing how to just be, Mm -hmm. (laughs) I get it, but practicing it over and over and over again so that you can start teaching yourself, no, it's, it's, it's okay. People don't leave me every time. Some people do, the unhealthy ones leave, but the healthy ones that are really valuable in my life, they love me regardless. They're still here. The only way to heal from this is to start practicing it. And I know, I know you know it, you know it in your head. I I know I'm valuable. I know I don't have to do things right. I know these things, but then it's getting, you know, your nervous system to catch up with that, getting your behaviors to look like that. You, you are totally capable Another thing that we kind of mentioned during our pause was, you know, again, you get to show us what a real badass woman looks like, because like I said before, you're pretty damn good at telling people no, you're pretty damn good at expressing yourself and standing up for yourself. And underneath, there's a lot of emotion and there's a lot of fear, but you still show up and you still take care of yourself. And that's a point that Last season, we talked about it a lot. Like, a badass bitch isn't a badass bitch because she's not scared. She's a badass bitch because she does it while she's scared. She does it anyways. It's scary. Yeah. It's scary to set boundaries, and it's scary to Mm -hmm. change and grow. And It's scary, and it's hard. It is. It's really hard. So your homework. Shit. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't sign up for this. (laughs) constantly remind yourself I don't have to smile I don't have to sound sweet I don't have to feed people I don't have to worry about what people are going to think about my opinions and my nose I don't ever have to give more than I'm comfortable giving I can sleep when I want it's okay if the decisions I make affect the people around me terrifying even I don't have to smile It's okay. If you're not happy, you don't have to smile for people. (laughs) Did that yesterday. I didn't like purposefully do it, but I was tired and we're in a staff meeting. Mm. And my director checked in on me a couple of times because I wasn't smiley, happy, go lucky, everything's so great. And I'm so cute, so sweet. Uh I was just like, I had a resting bitch face like majority of the morning because I was tired. And so he kind of just like, are you you okay? Like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just tired. And then again, like a little later, like, are you okay? Yeah, I'm just, I'm tired and I'm fine. It's okay. I'm allowed to be tired. I don't have to smile every day. I don't, I know that. But then as soon as I got those couple of check-ins, I'm like, I have to pretend to be happy. So that one's a hard one. Yes. And that one's been my whole life, even at home. Can't be mad. Can't be sad. Mm-hmm. Have to be happy all the time. That's just the way it is. Oof. Which my friend commented on the other day, too, because I called him because I needed to vent. I was so mad. <laughs> and I just vented and cried and then just, it's fine. I'm okay. I'm fine. And he just started laughing. And I was like, well, what and he's like you do that every time like you cry and you get super upset and you get really frustrated you just like stop and collect yourself and you're like but it's okay I'm fine like every time and you're not fine 
and it's not okay and you have every reason to be mad and upset and need to vent and be pissed off and be angry and stay that way for a little bit of time and feel that you're right to do that but you just I'm okay I'm fine it's fine he's like why why do you do that I'm like I don't know let me ask my therapist (laughs) (laughs) I don't know when our caregivers aren't comfortable with emotion they make us stop you know they'll make us either pay for it or they'll disconnect when we're having emotion or they'll tell us to ignore the emotion you know it's just because they aren't capable of being with us through the emotion and I remember as a child connection with caregiver is everything it's everything And when we are disconnected from or attacked for having an emotion, our nervous system then teaches us to either not feel or be scared of disconnection when we feel it's going, our nervous system is going to make our heart rate go up, make our temperature change. It's going to make us tense. It's going to make us feel like death is around the corner. Scary. So this is why as an adult, it's like, I can, I can know this. I know that it's okay for me to say no right now, but my body is freaking the fuck out because it was trained at an early age that if I say no, or if I have a feeling about something, that danger is coming around the corner. The most important people in my life disconnect from me or attack me when I have a fucking feeling. Thank goodness we can heal this stuff and change it <laughs> if we want. I guess I'm, I'm just bringing that up so that we have as much compassion for ourselves as possible. Because in these moments, you got to understand your body is actually behaving like it's in serious danger, even though it's not. Mm. And that's why I have that suggestion of keep putting yourself in the position where, yeah, you feel dangerous, but after a while, it'll start learning. Oh, it's not actually dangerous. It's okay. People don't disconnect from me when I say no. People aren't mad at me when I cry. (laughs) It's okay. It's all okay. What's after this for you? Um, go to the store and get stuff for dinner. You know, you don't have to, right? (laughs) I'm just joking. (laughs) I know. I know. And if you fit, oh my God. And I'm doing it because I feel bad. (laughs) You are? (laughs) Oh shit. I know. No, I felt bad because I made his favorite things that I make. I made it for a potluck for work. So when I was making it in the crock pot, he looked at it and he's like, is this for me? And I go, no. (laughs) And he just was so sad. (laughs) So sad. I felt bad. So, and they ate everything. So there wasn't any left. Mm. So I'm going to make that for dinner tonight. So. Yeah, they were like, hey, look at that. (laughs) If you didn't feel bad, would you still make it tonight? Probably not. Okay. Probably not. I probably wouldn't cook at all, to be honest, which I know is okay, and it's okay for me to not cook. Yeah. Which my my roommate has made very clear. Uh You don't have to make dinner. It's okay. We can go get something. But I, yeah, if I didn't feel bad, I probably wouldn't. No, I'd go home and... If I didn't feel bad in all honesty about anything, I would go home, not wear pants, Mm -hmm. lay on the couch, Mm -hmm. and watch Netflix for the next, like, three hours. Yeah. And do fucking nothing if I didn't feel bad. (laughs) But I feel bad, so (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to make dinner and wear pants and (laughs) not watch Netflix for three hours. And... I do have one of my coworkers invited me to a birthday party. I want to go, but I feel a little emotionally drained right now. Mm -hmm. So I kind of don't know if I'm going to go, but I also feel bad because I feel like I should at least go for like an hour and just say hi. But the reason I don't feel as bad saying no to that as I maybe, I guess, feel bad for about making dinner for my roommate, which I can do and still go to the party. I can't be around that many people when I'm Mm-mm. emotionally drained. No, of I course not. can't be around. <laughs> That's too many fucking people. So life presents you with lots of opportunities to just be rather than do. Mm-hmm. These are some examples. 
I understand why you would not want to practice just being because you're going to feel the fear and you're going to feel the discomfort of it. And, you know, maybe you just don't feel like dealing with that today and you would rather just do the thing because you feel bad and not have to deal with the fear and the discomfort. Okay, fine. But start at least paying attention to these opportunities as they come up. And when you have the energy to just be and feel it, feel the fear, feel the discomfort, feel everything, do it. Do it as often as you possibly can. It might just be once this week. Fine. I don't care. Just start practicing and be gentle with yourself. Okay. Anything else for today? I think that's it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. (laughs) I appreciate you very much. Where did we go? Where did we go? Where did we go? And where have I been? Who am I now? Who am I now? Who am I now? And who was I then? Is it all, all a lie? Is it all, all a lie? And we got to see a new side of Olivia this time, right? I want you guys to know that we did pause for about 15 minutes while Olivia, you know, had a moment. I was really proud of her. I asked if she wanted a break and she said yes. And she took it and she allowed herself to cry a bit. And we talked, you know, she worked some things out. And then when she was ready, she said, okay, I'm ready to do this again. And then we we got back to business. I know I mentioned last season that Olivia dips into real deep depressive episodes. Anyone who's in a depressive episode knows that there can be an override of negativity of thoughts. (laughs) And so what we just got to see with Olivia is when she starts experiencing an overwhelm or like an override of negativity. Because what's interesting about her is she actually does set really good limits in her life. And she's gotten really damn good at saying no and speaking up and taking really good care of herself. But when she got stuck in the loop of, I don't take care of myself, I'm of no value, I have this struggle, okay, uh, it was almost like an irrational negative loop that we just experienced. The first part of it was I saw her sort of check out of the room when I talked about where these thoughts come from. And it comes from early childhood because I think for her, it started clicking how she was treated in childhood. And when we took a pause, what she pointed out is the way she was treated in childhood continues today. And that became overwhelming for her. And that was probably a bad on me that I kept moving, even though I could see she would already checked out of the room. I went ahead and I asked another question that put even more overwhelm on her. And that was, do you have the energy now to even work on this? And for whatever reason, that was, that was just too much for her. This is how it goes with her. She does become overwhelmed with negative emotion She gets kind of caught in it. She has a hard time pulling herself out of it. Every time it happens, it gets a little bit shorter, a little bit less intense. So she is progressing, specifically using tools like what relationships do you have where you're sent the message that you're valuable without having to do anything? Her initial response was, I don't think I have any. She didn't say that out loud, but she started crying And just after years and years of seeing her every two weeks, I I know that that's probably where her head went. And when you're in that negative override state, your head is going to say things like that to you. I don't have any relationships where I don't have to do anything. It's not true, but our head goes there. But she stuck with it and she did identify one in particular with a friend that she's had for many years who expects nothing of her. And so when we accessed that opposite message in her life, she was able to pull out of it a little bit. She was able to respond to a couple of my jokes with some laughter. You know, she was able to lift up 
a little bit and get out of that negative override. She will probably feel quite low for the rest of the day. Again, just knowing her for so many years, this has kind of been her report from the past. So what I mean by she left the room, her body became very still. It's really hard to put words to it, but you can see when the eyes stop focusing on anything in particular in the room. This is something that happens with clients frequently when they're triggered. In fact, I would say I experience it four or five times a day in my, in my practice. It's very normal. We all do it throughout the day. It's a beautiful defense mechanism for all of us, right? If we stay present through all triggers and all traumas, we wouldn't survive. We have to be able to check out. We have to be able to dissociate. It's quite normal. What we want to do when we're working with our clients is to help pull them back into the moment. You come back, you're safe. We have to like retrain the nervous system that a trigger is not reality. <laughs> you weren't just in danger. Your body's responding like it's in danger. So let's come back to this moment so you can show your body that you're actually safe here. You're okay things that we can do would be responding to the environment again. So maybe touching your thighs or massaging your hands, accessing your breath again, looking around the room, moving around the room. You can change your position in the chair. You know, it's just interacting with yourself in the environment again can bring you back to the present moment. My rationale behind proceeding even though I could see she had left the room. The idea behind the question is like, look, you get to decide. You get to decide if you even want to do this work or not. You're in control here. It wasn't taken that way, but it was, for me, it was an attempt to put her back in the driver's seat and pull back into the moment. Didn't work. I absolutely relate to this. I was raised as well to work if I wasn't cooking or cleaning or earning money for the family or doing something, I was not invited. I wasn't invited to the conversation. I wasn't invited to the room. It's all about working, working, working. And so as an adult, I have a really hard time sitting still, always doing things, always. And I'm productive as hell. I get a lot done. And I've learned to embrace the fact that I'm a busybody, but I've had to learn how to not keep going until I'm sick because I will. I will make myself sick, literally sick, because I will not stop. And every partner I've ever had has complained because I won't stop moving. And all they want me to do is just sit down and watch a movie or something. Even the thought of that just drives me crazy, watching a whole movie. The story she told about her boss checking in with her three times about not smiling would that have happened to a male employee? The way she explained it was he kind of gave her a side hug. Hey, are you okay? Would that ever happen to a male? No. Men can have bad days. Men can be grumpy. Men don't have to smile when they walk in the room. And thank God, because we should all be treated like that. I'm glad that at least 50% of us get treated that way. If you're having a feeling, have a feeling. You don't have to live every moment to make everyone around you comfortable. If you're tired, sleep. If you want to go to the football game, go to the football game. This is how we should all be treated. <laughs> but women are not treated like that. We're just not. You can't sleep. There's things to do. Your family needs you. I know you're tired, but you got to push through and smile while you're doing it and look pretty while you're doing it. You know, there's just all these other layers of things that are expected of women. And I'm not, not every family is like this. Not every culture is like this, yada, yada, yada. But generally speaking, yes, this, I mean, it's just the reality. It's changing, thank goodness. I don't necessarily identify or relate to major depressive disorder. That hasn't been my struggle. Major depressive disorders are, are like a week long of, I cannot even get out of bed. I don't want to shower. I don't even want to eat, or I just want to eat all day long or I don't want to talk to people, I'm isolating myself, constant negative override. There can be tears, but not necessarily. It's probably more like loss of motivation, hope, 
and just wanting to sleep. That's what a major depressive episode looks like. Now, you don't have to have a major depressive episode to have some depression or to have a depressive episode. I mean, it might not be that extreme, but still, it is so difficult knowing that your brain is kind of playing tricks on you, knowing that the constant loop of negative and hopeless thoughts are not rational. It's not going to cure it. It's not going to poof, make it go away. But at least while they're happening, it can allow you to step outside of it and watch it like it's on TV and it's just a show and it's not real. Thoughts like nobody likes me. All my friends are annoyed with me. I'm probably going to lose my job. All the negative things that come to mind when we're depressed. You have to just keep reminding yourself these things are not true. They're not true. They're not true. They're not true. And like the chalkboard in my office has said for a couple weeks now, you have to do the shit you don't feel like doing. You have to get out of bed. You have to get your face in sunlight. You have to eat something that is nutritious. You have to do some jumping jacks and get your heart rate up every day. It is the exact opposite of what every cell in your body is telling you to do, but you have to. Whoa, I feel myself getting excited right now. It's this really delicate balance, though, of doing all the shit that you don't feel like doing while still honoring the depression that's happening and knowing that it's here for a reason. There's a reason why my body, mind, and spirit is like in shutdown mode right now. In my experience working with clients and the few, the few times I've experienced depression, what I've seen is that it's an it's a incongruence between who I think I'm supposed to be and who I actually am. And that's when our body, mind, spirit like shuts us down almost to say, hold on, you are not being yourself. Something about what you're doing is not right for you. You got to figure this out, babe, and I'm going to shut everything down until you figure it out. Yeah, this makes a lot of sense with Olivia, right? She told us it's like all day. She even gave us examples. The day's not, the day's half over and she's still going to go home and make a delicious, wonderful dinner for someone that she doesn't feel like doing, but she's doing it because she feels bad. And then she's going to go to a party that she doesn't want to go to because she feels bad. Yeah, I can see why her body, mind, and spirit is going, you are not being yourself. You're being this person you think you're supposed to be. It's not you, babe. Something that is really clinically important here, you see it in Olivia, but I'm sure people out there can identify with this. I see it in a lot of my clients. I see it in myself. This flip-flop between I got to keep going. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to record the podcast and then I'm going to go to the grocery store and then I'm going to make the dinner and then I'm going to da, 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 da. And then she flops to, I'm going to spend the entire day on the couch watching Netflix and do absolutely nothing. I'm not even going to put on pants. It's like this dichotomy, right? It's either this or it's nothing. This is really common for people who spend a lot of time doing shit that they don't want to be doing like a frantic effort to do all these things, followed by fuck all these things. I'm out. When we live a life of I do what feels good to me, I do what's right for me and in my life, and I you know, I don't do things really that I don't want to do unless I have to do them, we live more a life of moderation. You know, we don't have to swing, pendulate back and forth between, oh, I got to do all this stuff and fuck all this stuff. No, it's like, yeah, I just, I do what I like most of the time. (laughs) That swing isn't there so much. The most effective way to heal the nervous system, which is, you know, when your heart rate goes crazy and your muscles tense up and your, you know, eyes change and your thoughts start going crazy. That's when you're having a, a nervous system activation, right? Which happens a lot when we get triggered or we have an emotional response to something. 
the most effective way to heal is to move into that, to feel it, to allow the nervous system to get activated, and then to be present with it while it comes back down again. That's how you're teaching your nervous system, your body, your mind, your spirit, that I'm okay. (laughs) I'm okay. We're not actually in danger. Most of us shut that nervous system response off. We ignore it. We pretend like it's not happening or we intensify it. We keep going with it. We let it run. We let our mind go crazy and it just gets worse and worse and worse and worse until we're having a panic attack or we can't get out of bed for seven days, whatever. So in session, ideally what we want to do is step into that activation place, which is she went there today, and then we want to come back out of it. That over time, heals the nervous system. Now, like I said before, the time and the intensity is is getting shorter and smaller. Like every single time for her, she's making progress, but she can stay there for a pretty long time. So today, did, did we move into it and we kind of came back up out of it? Yeah, but we didn't come up all, all the way. In an ideal situation, we would have been able to spend the next three hours together. I probably would have, you know, taken her for a walk or, you know, made her a cup of tea or turned on some stupid show, you know, to really pull her back up out of it completely. But we didn't, we don't have that luxury, you know, as counselors. So tips for listeners. So important when you find yourself in the people pleasing role, which is basically what we were talking about all day today, right? People pleasing. At the core of that is, I don't believe that I'm valuable enough to just be. I have to be providing something. I have to be doing something for me to have value in your life. Right? That's not true. And anybody who suffers with this, I recommend you take a good look at your childhood and really take a look at what messages was I sent about my value in the family, my value to my caregivers, my value to the world. Now, messages typically aren't sent with words. (laughs) They're sent with behaviors. They're sent with pulling away from us. They're sent with attacks. So if I come home from school and I say, my tummy kind of hurts. I just want to sit down and watch cartoons. Is that okay? And my mom says, fine, I guess so. I guess I'll just do everything. She's withdrawing a connection with you because you're not helping with dinner or you're not vacuuming the house like she likes you to, you know, and that feels terrifying for a child to have their caregiver pull away from them. Or if you say, I just, you know, my tummy hurts. I just want to sit on the couch and watch cartoons. And your dad says, don't be such a baby. Get your ass up. Go help your mom with dinner. Now you're being attacked for not providing or not doing something for the family. And there's just a million different ways that we are sent messages that you have to be doing something for me, for me to want to be with you. When you learn what messages you were sent in childhood, it gives you a leg up as an adult because then you can start really challenging those messages. You know, that doesn't make sense or that doesn't work for me anymore. I think that people are valuable even if they have to chill on the couch for a couple hours so that they can feel better. I'm going to let myself chill on the couch today. You know, I would recommend just starting there. The next step is the terrifying step. It's the step where you actually sit down on the couch (laughs) and not do anything. It's that being step that Olivia and I were talking about where your heart is going to race. Your thoughts are going to go wild. I need to be doing something. This person is not going to want to have me back to their house again. I mean, you're going to go through a terrifying phase, but be with it. Be present with it. Allow it to happen. Allow it to come back down again and keep doing it as often as you can in your life until you teach yourself that it is safe and okay to just be. This has been Consent to Treat from Rachel Seavers and Elodie. (laughs) Thank you for listening and supporting beautiful people. Goodbye. Goodbye.